and the message. Well, the message for this evening has to do with some things I picked up from the Pepperdine University Bible Lectureship in lieu of tomorrow being Mother's Day. So, that being the case, uh, you see here, Instant Mom, just add coffee. You get the picture here. A mom's job is very tiresome. It's, it, it takes all her energy, and uh, I applaud those who are in mothers for all their love, encouragement, and all the work that they put in to take care of us here. So, that being the case, uh, Mamachi Philo. Happy Mother's Day to everyone here. You know what? If I was a mother, I would be so tickled if I ever received something like that or like a keychain or something that maybe my uh, grandson or granddaughter made for me here. Because it's something made with their very own hands. <laughs> that is so special here. <laughs> well, so, but I want to wish everyone a blessed Mother's Day. Not just those who are mothers, because there's some who, well, they're loving wives, but they're they're not yet mothers. And there are some who are unable to bear children for whatever reason, but who show motherly love to many, many children. They need to be recognized too. And we also must remember those mothers that have loved us, who have cared for us, and who have passed on. We must never forget them as well. So happy Mother's Day to all of you ladies future mothers, especially for those who are present mothers and those who have served their due calls here on earth before passing on. Well, I attended the uh, recent Pepperdine uh, Harvard Bible Lectureship, and I have to admit, this was uh, the best one that I enjoy. I mean, there's been better one because since the pandemic, attendance is about half of what it was before the pandemic. Last year, it was way down, and to, uh, this year it was considerably up, but not like it was before the pandemic. But this is one that I enjoy more than others for many reasons here. One is, you know, as I was uh, I had my sister Lillian with me, and that was a fantastic experience. And I took her around, and I was surprised to see as I showed her around the science department. Wow, they have a new picture of my daughter here, biology's honors thesis, and it shows that 2009. I says, why is it still up here? It must be because she's very special to a lot of people at Pepperdine, and that is true. I've been told that. And then I took my sister up to the Heroes Garden, up to see the highest place on the campus. And this is where they recognize a memorial for those who died in the 9-11. And a Pepperdine grad student who died in the plane that was destined to, uh, that was aiming for, to crash into the White House. But he took it down in Philadelphia and, and uh, then everyone died of plane, but he was a hero. You see, looking over this beautiful ocean, you see the clouds. It almost looked like we're of higher than the clouds, the way the angle is here. And you see Pepperdine University down here. I met some uh, interesting people. Uh, I met a Chinese man from China. He's an elder for the Campbell Church of Christ. And he attended the uh, Tai Chi class. He said he loved it so much. Uh, he loved to have a uh, star Tai Chi for Christ ministry up in Campbell, California. And his wife was a very humble lady. Uh, and she didn't brag about herself or anything. But I found out that she is a director of a scientific computing group at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. She was a big name heavyweight from Germany, and they met uh, while they are both studying at the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign, uh, both studying um, computer science there. And I met this fellow here, Roger Lee. He's an elder at the Dublin Church of Christ. And you see on the right him circle there, and uh, some of the group of the Chinese at the Dublin Church. And I think that's his wife, Michelle. Okay, I think that's her there. And uh, he said he's never studied Tai Chi before, but he liked it so much. They would like to start something like that up there as well. Hey, great, we can all join in together on Zoom. Then I met this fellow here, Noel Trias, who has joined us for the our Tai Chi group on Saturdays and Zoom. 
Uh, he and his wife are both CPA. They're members of the Escondido Church here. So I met a lot of people. That that made this trip more interesting than a past trip where I just attend class. But I met, instead of attending class, I met a lot of people that we sat together and ate together and fellowship that I got to know. And one of the first group, a class I attended there was on the Enneagram. Uh, I don't know if you know what that means, but my son Timothy gave me a book and says, Dad, you got to read this book here. It's a way to uh, decide how to improve relationships. And in this talk, this author here says, if I choose to do what is not mine to do, someone else isn't getting the chance to do what God called him to do. Some of us sometimes want to do everything for everybody else. And sometimes people don't get a chance to do what they should be doing as well. That's a very interesting thought here. And she also said something else that I, I jotted down because I thought it was, I said, isn't that true? She said that in almost every relationship, there's never real equality of love between two parties. Almost always there's one who does most of the loving and the other receives most of the love. So you hear this boy, this girl, I love you more. Than you. I love you more. I lo you hang up first. No, you you hang up first. No, no, I love you more. Than love. And, but when you get down to it, almost always one does most of the loving. But that's okay as long as you understand that. And if that is the case here, we need to keep our expectations realistic. Some of the problem is because we give so much love to our spouse, we expect our spouse to give back to us the same amount of love, the same quantity, quality of love, and sometimes they're loving us the best they can their own way. Very interesting thought here. Then I attended a class by Jeanette and Thomas Duvall at El Paso, Texas, and whose talk was Love, Truth, and Forever. Is there something known as truth that is true no matter what? Uh, they said that we're failing our children when we don't teach them that there are some things that are definitely true. The world, television, movies, they all want us to believe that there's no such thing as truth and that everything is relative. It's a matter of who does the talking. And they said, how would you answer this question? Because how we understand truth impacts every single aspect of our life. It affects how we treat our fellow man, how we uh, act at work, how see, we treat others when no one's watching. They asked, do you believe in the concept of absolute truth, that there is something called absolute truth? And they weren't asking for show hand. They said, just think about that. And they ask, is the truth the same for everybody, everywhere, all the time? Hmm. Uh, can your truth be different from my truth? Hmm. Is all truth relative then? So there's a scale from top to bottom here. And she didn't ask for how many show of hands, and I'm not going to ask for show of hands, but I want you to think about that. If you look at this here, if you're standing on the left, looking from the left, and you have a pair of binoculars, and you look at up there, and this is what you see. You see a round black object with a yellow halo. And you say, well, I know that's what it is, because I've seen it with my own eyes some circular object and it's like a white or yellowish halo. I know it's true because I've seen it with my own eyes. But what if, just what if, someone says, well, I see something very different. I see something that's kite shaped, diamond shaped, and it has a blue halo around it here. Then you might say, well, how can we resolve? Well, we're looking at maybe two different objects because mine's don't look like a kite and yours don't look like a oval. And mine is yellowish and yours is bluish. But actually, it's the same object that's 
suspended in space or something that's held up there. And if you're looking at it through one direction from down here, it casts a circular object, as you might see. And if you look the other way, from, this, from the right, you see something that's totally different. You see, both views are wrong. That's why we have to understand we can't always trust our senses, what we see with our eye. We must trust God when he tells us something because he created it. The Bible says in chapter 55, verse 8 and 9, uh, Anthony, could you read that for us? For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways are your ways my ways, declared the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your, your way, and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we must not compare what the world says, what uh, opinions of all the people say is right or wrong. We must trust in God's way, because God knows what is there. Then I went to another lecture, remembering Frank Pack. Frank Pack was one of my professor at Pepperdine. He was the most brilliant professor I ever had. He was the only uh, professor that come to every class with no notes in front of him, lecture off the top of his head, can mention all the questions and discussion, and can answer all the questions for the students on the spot. And when he come back the following class or following week, he knows exactly where he left off. A lot of other teachers said, well, let me look that up and I'll get back with you. But Dr. Pack, who earned his uh, doctorate from Vanderbilt University, he was a brilliant professor. And he says, we must keep our minds open. Like it says in the Bible, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 13. Uh, see, David, could you read that for us? Yeah, he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. In other words, some people say, I already know this, and they reject something or they accept something before they heard the pro and the con. What Dr. Frank Pack taught the, the religion major is that you must deliberately look at both sides of liberal view and conservative views uh, views that favor what we teach, uh, views that are opposed to what we teach, and see what does the Bible really say. He taught the class the most important lesson of life, how to think. All right. And the main lecture I did was by Dr. Bob Perez and Liz Perez at the uh, Santa Paula Church of Christ. Just keep swimming. And when I heard this, I, it makes me think of my uh, grandson, Julian. And uh, Bob Perez, he was an athlete. He was a star baseball player for Pepperdine. He said one of the scariest things is one day when he was out in the open sea and he got disoriented. And if you look left and you look right, and with the waves coming up, you, you're not sure if you saw land. Where is land? Is it to my left, to my right, then he looks back, where, 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 where am I? And then panic sets in. And some mothers, oh, house chores, running errands, pleasing uh, uh, the children, pleasing the husband, uh, a woman who has two arms but is expected to do the work of two or three people. Sometimes it's really tiresome. That's why on Mother's Day, we must really honor our, our wives, our mothers. And Dr. Bob Perez says, just keep swimming. Same thing with schoolwork or your labor, your job work. Just push on. Just keep swimming. When we look at the word not, not, and the word but, God gave Moses specific instruction for the Passover and Peter and for and, and Exodus. I mean, and Peter does the same for the church. But it will give us lesson how to deal with frustration in life today. They are measurement of one's progress. When we say not this, but this, it shows that we're growing. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 29 and on here. Um, the Bible says, if the dead is not raised, why be baptized? 
if there's no resurrection, let's just eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we're going to die. Don't be fooled by what the world says. For bad company corrupts good morals. People say, there is no God, there is no heaven. Um, just, this is the only life you have. Verse 31, think carefully about what is right and stop sinning. For to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. Some of you may think you know God, but by the way you live, you don't really know God. All right. All right. So Bob Perez says that we must be holy even when the times are bad. Well, during the wilderness wandering, the Jewish people wandered. They were carried by Moses out of the desert. And, oh, in the hot desert. Oh, where are we going? Does Moses even know where we're going? Does he even know what he's doing? All right. But God told Moses and told the people to tell them, you need to be holy even when times are bad. Even when you're not getting your work done, even if you're falling behind, even if you get so frustrated, you still must be holy because I've given you signs. People kept grumbling. But isn't this funny? The Bible says that God said every day, I will lead you by a pillar of smoke, a cloud that will lead you the way. And at night, there'll be a pillar of fire. A pillar meaning it went straight up and down. Would you have thought if you were traveling among with these large number of people and you say to your neighbor, Hey, isn't that kind of funny? You know, that, that must be a miracle. You notice the wind is blowing to our left? And you see the dust swirling to our left? But that cloud doesn't move. It just stays straight up and down. It keeps going. I think God truly is leading us. And yet we'll have friends. You know what some of our friends are going to say? Ah, no, nah, that doesn't mean anything. It's just maybe it's not blowing in out there in, in that area. They're just blowing in our area. You see how people are. There's some people who won't believe and have faith in God no matter what. And at night, they have a pillar of fire that just goes straight up. God's saying, I am with you. Even if you don't think that I am. Even when things are bad, I am with you. So therefore, you must be holy. So what Bob Perez says, one thing that swimmers always like is to have landmarks. What helps keep the swimmers keep swimming and make it a shore is when they see this here, and they could actually count it off. Right? Uh, how, I mean, if you if you're on the open sea, the waves get. Am I am I actually making progress, or is the waves actually carrying me further out? If you don't have any benchmark to go by, you don't know if you're actually moving forward or sideways based upon the currents. But if you have the piles in a pier, you can actually go, go one by one, one by one, one by one, swim as you get closer to shore to know I'm making progress. And guess what? That gives you hope that even if you're exhausted, that you, uh, you're coming close to shore. So keep swimming means to go from discouragement to encouragement. Even if you have a million and one things you never get done at home, you have things uh, needing to get done in your studies or the computer, just keep studying, just keep working, just keep hoping, just keep swimming. And Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 to 5, the Bible says, listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. It says here. So we see the relationship is between us and God, but that give us the basis, the foundation for a relationship horizontally. Then dating the right person, hopefully, or dating to find who's the, not the right person eventually marrying and finding your niche in society 
if you're going to be a doctor, a baker, uh, a policeman, a mailman, as you see on the top there here, um, a cook, uh, a fireman, you see all these uh, workers there. And focusing on your home life, uh, dedicating yourself to looking after your grandparents, looking after your children, looking after your grandchildren, looking after one another, developing a home life. All these are important here. And Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, 39, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord you got all your heart and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment of all. But the second one, which is also important, is you must love your neighbors yourself because of this golden rule to do unto others as you have others. You're not going to call people callously stupid. Hey, dummy, use foul language. Say, I hate you. Don't say such careless things that can hurt. People say sticks and stones might break my love, but words can never hurt me. Well, words can hurt and hurt very badly. Uh, I can remember when I was a, uh, a young child, uh, I was singing. I, I don't know if I was singing right or not. My mom was uh, saying, oh, you sing so nice. And then I heard from the other room, Someone say, no, he doesn't. He sounds terrible. And boy, that hurt my feelings. Since then, I became very shy about singing. Well, not so much since I became a Christian, because I know God doesn't judge me like that here. So we have to set your hope on Jesus and be holy. Only by setting a right relationship with God can we have the right relationship with our fellow man. And uh, this was also in the mind of Peter when he wrote First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, 16. And it means the same thing here. Just keep swimming. Just keep swimming. Don't just stop. So there's four things we need to learn. I'll be quick about this. One, you need to be alert. To keep swimming, you must be ready for the daily routines of life. You can't say, well, it's boring. It's boring. Well, that's the daily routines of life. Learn to appreciate good hard work. A job well done. Doesn't have to be exciting, but a job well done. But you have to be alert. It says in First Peter chapter 1, verse 13, Therefore, with minds that are alert, and fully sober, set your hope on the grace brought to you. Uh, uh, if it says don't swim, don't swim. I saw, let's see, a picture where it says do not swim. And it has a small print because of dangerous high levels of bacteria. And you see people in the water swimming. There are reasons for that. Or is a dangerous, strong undercurrent. No fishing, no bowling, no swimming. Because it can pull you out to sea. And even if you're a good swimmer, you can drown. And the Bible says in our spiritual life, in 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert and of sober mind. The devil is looking for someone to devour. And that might be you if you're not careful. Second thing. Keep your hope and focus in Jesus. Be holy. Just like the Jews in the wilderness wondering, it doesn't matter if it's tough out there. You need to be a holy person anyway. It doesn't matter if at work people are stabbing you in the back. You yourself need to keep holy. Put your hope in God, for he will see you through. First Peter 1.13 says, Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you. Okay. Don't dwell in the past. Learn from the past. Learn from the mistakes. Learn how you can do better in the future. But don't live in the past. If you just sit there, you're floundering the water. Uh, guess what? If you don't look around, be alert, look for landmarks, see where winds are blowing, where currents are blowing, what direction you came from. Uh, if you're on, out in the open sea, you, you may just end up going nowhere and you're just going to lose energy and just drown because you're spending too much time worrying about what might be instead of making progress. To just keep swimming, you must leave behind 
behind. Don't keep looking back because you're not going that way. If you're headed one direction, keep prodding on it. Uh, that's why it says in Leviticus 19.18, do not seek revenge or bear grudge against a fellow Jew, but love your neighbors yourself. Anyway, don't seek revenge. Seeking revenge and grudge means a person who keeps thinking about, I remember five years ago, I remember 20 years ago, I remember 30 years ago, this person did this. Now, how this is this my chance to get even? Oh my, that's a terrible way to live. Always seeking revenge. What's done is done. Move on. That's why I, I tell people when people get divorced, hey, there's only one way to get divorced amicably. One thing I hate to see is people get divorced and they tear each other like part and they're hating each other. Remember the love that once was there. We all make mistakes. Keep that in mind. And lastly, mere holiness. To keep swimming, you must mirror the holiness of God in what you do. And uh, I had a wonderful experience. Uh, Hung Lee was a um, uh, king of Pepperdine. He was not a Christian. He's uh, Vietnamese. He was valedictorian at his high school. He became, when he studied, he became a Christian Pepperdine. And now he recently, this year, was promoted to vice chancellor of the university. And I talked to some people, and some people said, Hung Lee is a wonderful person. He's a team player. He's always helpful. He's a person that when you talk to him, you find ways, how can I be of help to you? He seeks solution, not see uh, uh, problems. Uh, and he's a problem solver. He mirrored the holiness of God. And this is what my encouragement for you on the eve of Mother's Day. Mere holiness. You know, when I think of holiness, I think more of faithful, devout, religious Christian women. Um, some of you may know that I do volunteer work at uh, with the Chinese Parents Association for the Disabled. And when I go to all their activities and meetings, all their main workers, their full-time workers, their administrators, assistants, they're all women dealing with the handicap. And I was telling Luan as I was coming home, I says, you know why? It's because probably mothers care the most. Now, there are many exceptions, of course. I says, I talked to one of the fathers. I says, uh, can you come every week and help out with the karate class? And he said, oh, no, I can't come every week, but my wife will come here every week. And I didn't say anything, but I said, yeah, not surprised. Women are very special. So you men folks, Appreciate the ladies in your life. Show them due honor where they're mothers or expectant mothers or otherwise. Women should be treated as ladies and with due respect. So my hat's off to everyone. So once again, let me sign off by saying Mamaji Philo. Happy Mother's Day to everyone. Uh, even to you men folks. I hope this word is a word of encouragement to you. Uh, from lessons that I learned here and there, potpourri from the Pepperdine University Bible Lectureship. Hope to see more of you come next year. And Lillian, if you want to come out, stay in the dormitory, let's do it again next year.